Hello and welcome to another installment of Foreign Policy Digest Worldviews, a series of interviews conducted by the staff of Foreign Policy Digest in which we meet with leaders and experts in the field of foreign policy to go behind today's headlines in order to discuss the issues and events affecting the world today. My name is Adam Benz and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy Digest and we are meeting today with Monica Varma who is the Director of the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Center for Human Rights to discuss the situation in Haiti. Monica, thank you so much for meeting with us yeah, today. My pleasure. The center has a long history of involvement in Haiti, and has, has it changed in the light of the earthquake? Has Absolutely. It changed Absolutely. Absolutely. I, mean, I think it, it. I think everyone's still in shock, um, and as are we, I mean, especially for those who us who worked in Haiti. And it's very, it's very hard to see what's happening. Um, but I think our focus is very similar. What is the international community going to do? All of this money is going to go into Haiti now. How do we make sure that it strengthens the infrastructure? You know, supports human rights. Um, and, and you know, th there's so much goodwill right now, there's so many good intentions, but if it's not um, channeled, it, it can actually do a lot of harm, and specifically what I mean by that is, historically most money going into Haiti goes through the NGOs, and NGOs are needed, um, and they're doing wonderful work there, but it has to be coordinated in, in support of, uh, in some sort of partnership or coordination with the government so that you're strengthening the water system. If you do, if an NGO does a water, you know, repairs a part of the water system and doesn't coordinate with the public works ministry, when they lose their funding or change their priorities and leave, there's a broken water system there. Okay. Um, so, you know, we're really looking at how do we make sure that the the donors, um, and, and you know, there's a lot of money we're talking about. You know, it's going to take billions of dollars to to repair what's been broken and also to strengthen. Um, what's there and, and how do we make sure that that it's done in, in the most um, sustainable way and also what are the, the member states you know the, the the donor countries what are their human rights obligations mm -hmm. um, and and to put it simply it's to do no harm in your article that you recently wrote for our February issue of foreign policy digest on corruption you discussed a history of mistakes by the US government in Haiti could you provide us with some examples of ways in which USA has been harmful to Haiti in the past? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think it's more, well, one of the examples is, is the NGO example that I gave. Mm -hmm. um, for many years, particularly starting um, really strongly in 2000 because we didn't, our government did not like the, uh, the government of Haiti at that time, um, you know, we, we channeled all of our money through NGOs and not to the government, stopped all money to the government. Mm -hmm. And as I said, you know, when you're looking at some of the most fundamental mm -hmm. structures in Haiti, water and education and food and, and um, you know, agriculture and, and health, to bypass the government is disastrous. And so that's sort of the way the money has, has gone in has been problematic. There were also, you know, significant uh, egregious steps that were taken by our, our government at that time, particularly um, we worked very hard to block um, loans to Haiti which were approved through the Inter-American Development Bank. And these were loans for water, health, education, and rural roads. Uh, and, you know, we at the RFK Center investigated it. We, we went through Freedom of Information Act litigation and, and uncovered a pretty nasty paper trail of what we had done to deliberately make sure that that money didn't get to Haiti. And again, these were loans that were approved and set to go. You've discussed many of the issues uh, that are urgently needed to be responded to in the country from health to infrastructure to rebuilding. What do you think the international community should focus the most on right now? What is the most urgent need for the, to ensure that the pledges from the international community are as effective as possible in helping the Haitian people? It, it's pretty simple. I mean, I think, you know, at the, at the international level that we make pledges two things that the government is asking for. The government's creating a plan which we will then pledge money for at the, at the donors conference at the end of March. Um, historically, those pledges are not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, and after the earthquake, uh, the hurricanes hit um, in 08, there was a donor conference last April and you know, a significant amount, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars were pledged. 85% of that money never got to Haiti. Okay. Um, and that was after some very difficult, you know, emergency-like situation. But that hit Haiti, I mean, nothing compared to what we're seeing right now. So I think the first step is that those pledges are fulfilled and that they're fulfilled along the commitments that were made. So if, you know, if a particular government decides to give money to, again, you know, agriculture in a particular part of the country, they shouldn't then go back and then give money for elections. You know, that's, you know, that, that's the first step. Also, I think there's a real opportunity here to 
do things differently. Make sure that we're involving local communities in developing projects and monitoring projects and, and, and like I said, having recourse if they're not, um, they're not fulfilled. Um, to really look at the Haitian people as partners. I mean, we're talking about the need for accountability and transparency in the way that pledges are handled. Mm -hmm. Balancing that with the additional urgent need to respond to the incredible humanitarian crisis facing mm -hmm. the country as quickly as possible. Yeah. Do you feel that it's difficult to balance those two? Do you feel that in some ways emphasizing one aspect is going to in some ways reduce the emphasis on the other? Is there a way to kind of keep I, I think they're. I think they're being. I, I think you're right. I mean, we have to be careful. There's an immediate humanitarian need that's there that that, that can't be ignored, and I think that's where a lot of the attention is, mm -hmm. um, which is critical to sort of the people staying alive right now. What we worry about is that, you know, six months from now, when the attention has shifted, um, a lot of those people are going to have those same needs: um, housing and, and medical care and, and survival. Um, but then there's the additional sort of recovery, rebuilding, um, strengthening needs, and that it, it, it's critical that we're thinking about both. And I think that you know the, the rhetoric has been good coming out of both the U.S. Um, government as well as the U.N. And, and we're fortunate to have um, you know, President Clinton as a special envoy who knows Haiti and is a real strong personal and professional commitment to the country. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think people are talking about it, they're focused on it. The, the question is the political will in the international community to stay focused, to meet those commitments, and, and, and it's harder to work in the way that we're suggesting to, to really, you know, it, it's much easier to give to an NGO. And, and it's not easy to work with um, the Haitian government that's always had very limited, you know, capacity if you compare it to the United States or, you know, other places. But if we want to do it right, that's what we've got to do it. You've discussed a lot about the change in the approach of this administration from that of the mm -hmm. prior administration. How substantive has that change been? I, I think we have to see how that machinery is going to change within our administration. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a way that USAID works mm -hmm. in Haiti and, and all over the world. Mm -hmm. In order to do the things we're talking about, making sure that there's transparency and accountability, our machinery has to change. I mean, if you try to track a USAID project sitting in Washington um, down to the ground to see what impact it's had, it's very difficult to do. Right. And you know, we can get online, we can call USAID. I mean, we have a lot of resources that someone in a community that's waiting for a project or, or needs something, um, it, it, it's going to be much harder for them and um, you know, for, for people there to track it. So I, I think there's a lot of good rhetoric, and I, I'm, you know, we're, we're working very hard to to, to get that message across of, of the, the machinery and the mechanics really needing to match that rhetoric. Right. Yeah. And finally, uh, how hopeful would you say that you are that we may have reached a turning point in the U.S.'s relationship with Haiti, specifically the U.S. government and the Haitian government, but also the U.S. and the people and the Haitian people in general? Um, I'm, I am hopeful. I mean, I, I, like I said, I've been very um, encouraged by the statements coming out of the Department of State through USAID, I mean, generally through our administration, I think there's been a real um, genuine shift in, in the way that we're approaching this issue. And, um, you know, I, I don't need to say how wonderful the support of the, the American, the international community on an individual level has been. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, if you look at just our laureates alone, I mean, our laureates in other places, our, our laureates in, in Immokalee, Florida, which is um, a migrant farm working community. I mean, their office was, was flooded with things for Haiti. I mean, and these are people who, who really have very little, um, you know, there's just been so much solidarity too with our, our laureate in New Orleans who worked on Gold Coast. I mean, the first thing he said is, how can I, he said, I don't want to help right now. I want to help with recovery because we've done it in New Orleans. We know how it needs to be done. Our laureate in India who worked after the Gujarat earthquake too, you know, said, you know, I've got a lot of lessons learned. And, and I think, you know, but. But beyond that, I mean, just the average person watching Haiti is so deeply moved and personally connected. So I think that that, you know, we can sustain that um, connection, which I, it, it's been amazing that it's um, it, it's been over a month now and people are still talking about Haiti and still wanting to focus on it. So I, I'm hopeful and I, I hope that the, the machinery and the powers that be will will shift in the way that's, that's needed to, to actually actualize the, the change that we're hoping for. Monica, thank you so much for taking the time today. It's been a pleasure.